Well, good morning and welcome to our DTS Chapel once again. Uh, today we continue with our lectureship series, the W.H. Griffith Thomas Lectures, and I'm delighted to introduce once more our guest speaker, Dr. Joel Lawrence. Uh, Dr. Lawrence is the executive director of the Center for Pastor Theologians. Uh, prior to this role, Joel served for seven years as the senior pastor of, at Central Baptist Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. He also served as Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and Ethics at Bethel Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota for eight years. Joel holds degrees from uh, Texas A&M University, uh, from Dallas Theological Seminary, and from Cambridge University also. He's the author of Bonhoeffer, A Guide for the Perplexed, uh, published in 2010, as well as numerous articles and chapters in books on a variety of theological and pastoral subjects. Uh, Joel and Mindy, his wife of 25 years, live in the Twin Cities with their four children, Bethany, Anna, Catherine, and Micah. Joel, it's a pleasure to have you with us once again. Thank you for your ministry in general and for your ministry to us this week. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Murphy, and I just want to do want to thank you and the the PM department for the invitation to come and to give these lectures. It's a a, a tremendous privilege, and um, grateful for the time that, that we have together once again today. Let's pray as we begin our time. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would meet with us as we reflect on the things of the church of pastors, the opportunities and the challenges that we have before us, I pray that, that you would be guiding our steps, that you would be shaping each one of us as your servants. And I pray, God, that the things that I have on my heart to share today would be used by you, and that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight. Amen. We are living at a moment of crisis for Western liberalism. 2020 and its aftermath was not the beginning of the crisis, but rather was an accelerant of an already present weakness. On both the left and the right, people are questioning the premises of Western liberalism. On the right, we have calls for illiberal democracy, a philosophy pursued by Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban and approved by numerous politicians and pundits on the right. This notion claims that because liberalism promotes the self-interest of individuals, it is not sufficient to serve the interest of society and secure the tradition of a nation. Therefore, we need more authoritarian leadership to protect the national interest. On the left, we have claims that Western liberalism is fundamentally racist because it was created by and aims to serve a powerful elite, leading to a rise in Americans who argue that the United States should embrace socialism. Patrick Deneen, in his book, Why Liberalism Failed, argues that liberalism is failing because liberalism has succeeded. What he means by this is that liberalism, founded on the self-interest of humans, will inevitably lead to a factionalized, disintegrating, self-protective society in which the overarching goals of society that transcend individuals are lost as each person is trained by liberal anthropology to be an autonomous individual, not connected in any essential way to a larger community. So liberalism, positing the self-actualization and self-definition of individuals, is a tradition-dissolving philosophy that views tradition as a barrier to the achievement of the self, and so leads to ever-deepening factions 
of self-interested autonomy. Such traditionless societies cannot long endure. Barbara Walter, in her recent book, How Civil Wars Start, has studied civil wars across the globe since the end of World War II. And she shows that the primary predictor of a civil war beginning in a nation is when a political society turns from a shared ideology to individual identities focused on the self or focused on the in-group that the self belongs to. Though Walter doesn't make the same point about the logical conclusion of Western liberalism, her account of what creates instability in society aligns with Deneen's account of the success-driven failure of liberalism. My goal today is not to solve the crisis of liberalism. I don't know the course of the future of liberalism as a political philosophy, though I do believe that Western liberal societies are in for some difficult times ahead. I don't see a clear path that leads to a unified American society. And so believe that we will continue to experience fracturing in our public life. And though Christianity on both the left and on the right has often believed that the progress promised by Western liberalism is the advance of God's rule, there is no theological basis for believing that the Western liberal order will avoid the fate of all other ideologies which do not last and are replaced by something else. As a pastor theologian, my primary concern is with the health of the body of Christ. I believe that the apocalypse of 2020, the revelation of 2020, must force the church to ask significant questions about how we understand our presence in the world and how that presence has been captured by the pattern of the age. So my goal in this final lecture is to encourage the, tr the church toward a faithful witness in the present and coming crisis by calling us to a non-conformed presence in the world that we might be ambassadors who represent God's political rule, even as the political rule of earthly kingdoms falter. For the church to be a faithful witness, to be citizens of the holy nation of God, we must have pastors prepared to shepherd the body of Christ through the challenging days ahead. To prepare pastors for this task, we must reclaim the pastor theologian as the primary identity of the pastor. The church needs a vanguard of pastor theologians who will shepherd God's people by producing a robust ecclesial theology. This means a theology rooted in and aimed at the local church. A theology that is the living font of the church's life in the world. A theology that shapes the church's life together by centering the church on the common objects of love that are ours as followers of Jesus Christ. A theology that forms the church's theological imagination and so frees us from the pattern of the age. Only then will the church be free to love and to serve the world as those who are, through the Spirit, the presence of the crucified and resurrected Christ on earth. So today I want to offer a vision of the church's nonconformed presence. Before I do that, let me offer a brief recap of where we have been so far in these lectures. On Tuesday, I suggested that the political anthropology of Western liberalism defines humans as self-interested, autonomous individuals. This anthropological vision brings with it a humanity enthralled by the enchantments of mammon, longing for the power to ensure its own self-defined identity. As this vision has expanded across the globe, 
It has become evident that Western liberalism's promises cannot be universally granted, and so our age has become the age of anger, an anger deriving from the reality that billions have been promised a life of self-interested autonomy, but have not had that promise kept and believe that it won't be kept. Then yesterday, I traced the church's conformity to this pattern, demonstrating how the church has adopted the Western liberal political anthropology as her own, and so been captured by the enchantments of mammon that dominate our age, a capture that is seen in the church's self-interested striving for worldly power to protect ourselves. This striving has also infected the church with anger, an anger that has burst forth in the past few years, born out of the sense that we are losing what we have been promised, having accepted the promises of Western liberalism's vision as our own. Now, if, as I argue, the church is conformed to a particular anthropology— and its effects that make up the pattern of our age, then what remains for me to do today is to propose an alternative anthropology that can enliven the church in our life and in our mission and free us from our conformity. So today I turn from lament to hope. Today I turn from the church in conformity to the pattern of the age to the church's freedom as those who are released from that pattern. Today I am proposing that the church is called to live as the Sabbath presence of God, a theological, anthropological vision that frames the church's being in the world, calling us to be the Sabbath people of God on earth. In my previous lectures, we have gone back in history to Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, to the Reformation and the medieval world that it sought to overturn. This morning, we must go further back. We must go way back, all the way to in the beginning. Now the earth was formless and empty Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. So begins the story of God and his creation. The story of the light that bursts forth, the stars that shine, the earth filled with fruit, and humanity created to dwell in the majestic world of God's creative love. In my lecture on Tuesday, I stated that politics is anthropology, the ordering of society based on human nature. And that is true, but it is not complete. Because biblically, Politics is not merely anthropology. Politics is theology. The ordering of the world based on the nature of the creator God. As such, I propose that Genesis 1 should be understood as the political ordering of the heavens and the earth. If politics is about ordering life, so that we can live together in society, then Genesis 1 is the foundational account of political order, describing God organizing the world under his rule. The six days of creation, the and God said, and so it was, describes the Lord creating politics, i.e. creating an ordered universe under the sovereign ruler of the cosmos. This political ordering is the shaping of the world that will prosper under God's benevolent rule. In his creation, the Lord demonstrates his heart and nature as the triune God, the God who is 
love, who in God's very self is ordered as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, united as one God in the perfection of love, the one who is holy, 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 the very template of peace, prosperity, and mutual self-giving. And this God creates a world to live in by his grace, in his care, under his truly good rule. On the sixth day of the political ordering of the universe, the triune God establishes his image on earth. Humanity as male and female, created to reflect the divine life. As male and female, shared inheritors of the life and promise of God, Adam and Eve are a template of humanity living under God's political rule. Fruitful and multiplying, truly free, not in self-interested, independent autonomy, but in the self-giving love of God and neighbor as they dwell in life together in the presence of the Lord. Then, in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, we come to the culmination of the political ordering of the heavens and the earth the seventh day Sabbath. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. There are a great many books on Sabbath these days. Almost all of them are in the genre of spiritual formation, having to do with how individuals can find rest in a manic world by keeping Sabbath. And while I have benefited from and appreciate the emphasis on Sabbath as a spiritual discipline, I don't believe that we understand the fullness of the biblical teaching on Sabbath if we view it as a spiritual discipline of rest, because this misses the primary nature of Sabbath. Fundamentally, Sabbath is a political concept. The word that Genesis 2 uses to say that God rests is Sabbath. On the seventh day, God Sabbathed. But what does it mean that God Sabbathed? Commenting on these verses, the biblical scholar Scott Hafeman writes, quote, God rests not because he is exhausted, but as the sign that there is nothing more to provide. The king's rest on the, seventh day, on the Sabbath day of creation declares the good news that under his sovereign reign, everything in his realm is as it should be. In the ancient world, the notion of the king at rest is a declaration that the realm is secure. The people are provided for. The peace of the nation is assured. At the end of the sixth day, the world is ordered according to God's loving, giving, peaceful nature, and all is as it should be. God has established a universe under his rule. The earth is productive through the Lord's providential creation, humans as the image of God are present on earth, not as sovereigns, but as servants, not as self-interested, autonomous individuals, but as a community of shared blessing, of peace, love, and rest as the image of God on the earth. The Sabbath is the declaration of life as it is intended by God. The creation is created to live under God's Sabbath rule and so live in his provision and in his protection. Genesis 2 reveals the providential God providing for his creation through the fruit of the earth and shows a communion of humans living in the peace of God's protection, secure in his loving Sabbath 
political rule. This is a vision of a world in which there is no war, no violence, no competition for resources, because God provides through the fruit of the earth that he has created and through the labor of humans to bring in that fruit. This is a world in which there is no factionalism, no nationalism, no racism, no us versus them, because all are one under the Sabbath rule of the Lord. There is no injustice because there is no need to accumulate power to secure our own autonomous vision of life for ourselves. No need to amass resources for the sake of securing our own. There is no enchantment with mammon because we are secure, not in our own power, but in God's rule. There is no anger because we are not striving to achieve our own vision of ourselves, but living securely in God's presence. There is Sabbath, there is rest. There is shalom. This is the Sabbath rest of the political order of the cosmos. The creator king is at rest. The realm is secure. The people are provided for. All is as it should be. This is Sabbath politics. The political life that humanity, that you and I, were created to enjoy. And this is the life that we lost when we rejected God's political rule over us in order to exert our own. And this, of course, is how the story continues in Genesis 3 and 4. At the beginning of these lectures on Tuesday, I said that the pattern of the age of Romans 12 is rooted in the rebellion of Genesis 3. Over these last few days, I have described the pattern of the age as the structures and ideologies that dominate our age. They are the wisdom of this world, of a world living according to the things that are seen rather than the things that are unseen. These structures and ideologies arise from the human heart in rebellion against God, the rebellion that we have depicted for us in Genesis 3. If my reading of Genesis 1 and 2 as the political ordering of the cosmos is correct, then Genesis 3 is best understood as a political rebellion against the Sabbath politics of the Lord a rebellion through which humans reject the ordering of the world under God's rule, instead believing that we can be our own political rulers. This is the sinful condition, which is a political condition. It is about who rules, who has authority, who has power. When the serpent tempts Adam and Eve, he does so by declaring to them that if they would take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would become like God. A proposition that tempts Adam and Eve to believe that there is a better way than God's way. After they take the fruit, God declares that Adam and Eve have indeed become like us. And this condition of Adam and Eve's God-likeness in Genesis 3 has a very specific definition in that passage, knowing good and evil. They have become like us, knowing good and evil. But what does it mean that we have become like God, knowing good and evil? Bonhoeffer, in his book, Creation and Fall, which is my favorite Bonhoeffer book, suggests that this means exactly what it says, that humanity prior to the rebellion did not know good and evil and were not intended to ever have the knowledge of good and evil. 
So if humanity did not know good and evil prior to ingesting the fruit, what is it that we did know? We knew God. We were created to live in unbroken fellowship with the Lord, walking directly with him in his presence, an immediate life of communion with the Lord. And in this, we would live in utter dependence upon him, trusting in every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord, confident that his word is our very life. But we were never intended to scrutinize that word, to sit in judgment over God's word, to appeal to ourselves as the analytic center through which we determine whether or not the word of God is practical, beneficial, useful, or effective. We were not intended to have the knowledge of good and evil because we were not intended to be our own gods, to be the center of our own lives. Instead, we were called to walk in obedience to the word of the Lord, trusting in God as our benevolent shepherd. And in this obedience to God, free to dwell with him and our neighbor in unbroken unity, with hearts directed away from ourselves towards God and towards our neighbor. Because of this, we can see that it is the knowledge of good and evil that separates us from God. This is the content of our rebellion against God. And taking for themselves the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve break fellowship with God and neighbor by exerting autonomy. Autonomy derives from two Greek words, auto, self, and namos, law. In the rebellion of Genesis 3, Adam and Eve reject life under the rule of the Lord and instead choose a life of auto namas, self-law, becoming a law unto themselves, becoming their own lords, their own gods. And in doing this, the human orientation to the world was turned from a God-referential life of obedience to a self-referential life as autonomous, independent individuals separated from the fundamental community with God and neighbor that we were created to enjoy in the Sabbath politics of the Lord. After the rebellion, God pronounces the curse that their sin brought into the world, declaring the implications of this new reality. Where there was to be Sabbath, there will now be striving. Where there was to be rest, there will now be struggle. Where there was to be love of God and neighbor, there will now be self-interest. Where there was to be obedience, there will now be autonomy. As a result, Adam and Eve are removed from God's Sabbath presence, and an angel is set on the east side of the garden to guard the way to the tree of life. And here, history east of Eden begins. And political organization, intended to be the ordering of the world under the Sabbath rule of God, begins to take shape as east of Eden politics. By East of Eden politics, I mean the ordering of the world by self-oriented, autonomous humanity, organizing the world according to our self-referential knowledge. According to Andrew Goddard, the world today is not God's good creation of life, love, and freedom, in which humans in communion with God mediate his presence in the world. It is the counter-creation of rebellious human beings and the powers bearing the marks of its rejection of the creator. This is the pattern of the age, the counter-creation of rebellious humans. This East of Eden political reality begins to take shape in Genesis 4, focused on the figure of Cain. In this familiar passage, Cain murders his brother 
inaugurating the violence of self-assertion in history. God confronts Cain and pronounces a curse, declaring that Cain will be, quote, a restless wanderer on the earth, no longer dwelling under God's Sabbath rule, in God's Sabbath rest, Cain now becomes a restless wanderer, asserting his own self-rule, and history becomes Cainite as Cain builds a city. This city, Enoch, was built in the land of Nod, east of Eden, and it is the symbol of the new political ordering of the world marked by the rebellion of humanity. Cain, knowing his vulnerability, now builds for himself a city for his own protection, secured by his own resources, his power, his initiative. Nod means wandering. And so we have here the irony. Declared by God to be a restless wanderer, Cain rejects God's judgment by refusing to accept the consequences of his rebellion and instead chooses to settle in the land of wandering. According to Jacques Ellul, Nod is the nowhere land, the counterfeit Eden. Eden was to be a place of security, of peace, of settlement in the presence of the Lord, where humans are provided for by him in his Sabbath political realm. Nod and its city Enoch is the place of counterfeit settlement, of humanity endeavoring to secure peace and security for ourselves through our own autonomy, through the knowledge of good and evil. We see in this that the pattern of the age is the human attempt to mitigate the effects of human rebellion against God and to create for ourselves the conditions that we have lost by rejecting God as our Sabbath Lord. And it is here. In the east of Eden attempts to create a secure social reality that life becomes deeply insecure and history becomes Hobbesian, the war of all against all. Living outside the Sabbath rule of the Lord, humanity must build our own structures and consolidate our own power to secure what we have lost. Having lost the Sabbath Sabbath presence of the Lord, we must now form the world through our autonomy. And this is the tragedy of the world east of Eden, the world in rebellion against God. We have lost Sabbath because we have rejected God, but we long for Sabbath We know in our souls that like Cain, we are restless wanderers on the earth. We know that we are vulnerable and we fear our vulnerability. So we work to ensure our own security through our efforts. However, we find in this another tragedy. In pursuing security, provision, protection for ourselves, We create an insecure, unequal, and dangerous world. As Hobbes saw, we gather into associations for the sake of protection, but so does everyone else. These self-interested associations of protection create an unstable, unjust, violent, and perilous world. The great tragedy of life east of Eden, is that the more we strive to secure our own lives, the more insecure our world becomes. One of the strengths of Western liberalism is that it recognizes the reality of humanity in our fallen condition. As those in rebellion against God, we are self-interested. As those in rebellion against God, we are autonomous. In our sinful condition, in life east of Eden, we are individuals who pursue our own needs and work to secure them. In all of this, Hobbes is, in my estimation, the most honest political philosopher of them all. 
He knew the human condition. He saw the inherent instability of life in a world dominated by competition for power. His error was that he located this in the state of nature. But what we find in Genesis 1 through 4 is that there is no such thing as the state of nature. It is a fiction of the philosophers. Instead, there is the state of creation, Sabbath politics, and there is the state of rebellion, east of Eden politics. Hobbes rightly saw that society was deeply competitive. Rousseau rightly saw that humans in society are prone to vanity and injustice. Locke rightly saw that we need to create laws to protect our property. And they built a political system that recognized this vision of humanity. It may be that Western liberalism is the best system possible for organizing society east of Eden. It may be that this is the best we can do to keep the passions of the self-interested human heart in check. It may be that Western liberalism, which has brought wealth or mammon to many, is the best that we can hope for. It may be that east of Eden, there is no better way. But what Western liberalism cannot do is describe for us the world as created by God in Genesis 1 and 2. The world of Sabbath as intended by God. This means that Western liberalism cannot reveal humanity as created by the Lord. No East of Eden political ideology can. So who can? Who can be a demonstration of humanity as intended by God? We can. The church can. The church is called to be the unique community who, through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, represent the seventh day of creation. Therefore, the church is called to be a nation that doesn't share the common objects of love of the pattern of the age, who don't give our hearts to the things of this age. We are called to be the Sabbath presence on earth, not engaged in the war of all against all, but a holy people living under the Sabbath political reign of God, a people who, by the Spirit, are being freed from east of Eden, striving. As the church, as the Sabbath people of God, we are called not to protect our own self-interested autonomy, not to be divided by the worldly markers of Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, rich and poor, black and white. We are called to be a just society because we are the Sabbath society who rest in God's peace, who trust in God's provision, who share in God's bounty with all in our Sabbath community. We are called to be united not by national citizenship or the goals of fleeting nation states, but by gathering around Jesus, the Christ, the Sabbath one of God, who didn't live as a self-interested autonomous individual, but instead lived in obedience to his Father. We are called to gather around the Christ who was the last Adam, who obeyed where the first Adam rebelled. Jesus didn't live according to the knowledge of good and evil. He lived according to the word of his Father. He didn't exercise his right to protect himself through the powers east of Eden, but he told his disciple to put away his sword. We are the body of this Christ. 
called to be the Sabbath nation on earth, declaring to the world east of Eden that there is a different way, the way of the Lord and his Sabbath rule. We have this vocation. We have the word of God. We have his vision for humanity and the world. And we have the spirit who frees us from conformity to the pattern of the age and makes us to be a light that shines in the darkness. And we have pastors, women and men called to shepherd the church to be faithful witnesses of the Sabbath rule of God. But we are too often failing in our calling. We have become conformed to the pattern of the age. We have given our hearts to the ideologies of the wisdom of this world. We've been captured by a political vision that is not our own, by the enchantments of mammon that demonstrate our trust in worldly powers, by the age of anger that reveals that we are believing in promises that have not been given to us. There are no techniques that will lead us out of our conformity to the pattern of the age. There are no ready-made programs that we can purchase that will free us from this capture. There are no marketing firms that we can call and have them design a slick campaign that will guide us through the church that test, uh, the, the, through the tests of the church of this time. We have become too dependent on these tools, too trusting in techniques and programs that promise to solve our problems and grow our churches. So what is to be done? There is deep, fervent, and courageous theological work to be done, and this must be done by the shepherds of the church, by pastor theologians. The church needs pastor theologians who minister out of the core identity of theologian, whose whole selves are given to the task of shepherding the church and her theological mission. The church needs pastor theologians whose imaginations are fired by a vision of God, allowing them to see through the pattern of the age. The church needs pastor theologians who will patiently and graciously shepherd teachers, plumbers, and doctors whose lives are shaped by the imaginative framework created by the pattern of the age to see the world that has been punctured by the cross. The church needs pastor theologians whose preaching reframes the world theologically and re-narrates for our flock in ways that counter the vision that has shaped our visible world. The church needs pastor theologians who believe in spite of all of the failure and all of the pain that it can inflict, that the church is worth our lives. Will you be a pastor theologian? Will you be a servant of God's church? Will you courageously and joyfully give yourselves to the mission of shepherding the Sabbath people of God out of our conformity to the pattern of the age? that we might truly be the Sabbath presence of God on earth. The church is worth it because it is for the glory of God. Our Heavenly Father, you have given us a tremendous calling as shepherds. I pray for each one who is hearing these words that you would move by your spirit to lead them and to guide them to the ministry that you have called them to and that they, as pastor theologians, would shepherd your flock for your glory. 
And it is in your holy name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen.